you, we open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for gathering us uh, today, Lord, in the first session of the seven-week training. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be um, leading each heart, Lord, each woman in this room, um, that the lecture today, the reading uh, from the homework from the book, Lord, will continue to uh, nudge us, will continue to open our eyes, open our um, hearts, Lord, and we are being taught, we understand what is the Bible said about making disciples. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will be in charge of every mind and every heart, that we will be focusing, Lord, on what you want us to learn, what you want us to embrace today. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. So first, I would like to define um, what is discipleship. So for today, this is what I, would, I am going to cover. We are going to talk about what is discipleship. Why should we disciple? And how can we disciple? Because the definition of discipleship is so huge, so wide. Um, every organization, every movement have their own definition of discipleship. So I thought that today it is very, very important we define what is the discipleship for the purpose of this training for this course. And we also will, will discuss why should we disciple and how can we disciple. By the way, I enjoy reading your homeworks. Thank you for your good work. Well done. Very good. I am so blessed to, eat, to, reach, to read each homework. And there's a lot of questions there. Good question. But I will answer that as we go through session two, session three, session four. All those questions will be answered. Not today's. I will answer some today. But uh, if I can, right? I, I am not all knowing. Uh, some I still don't know the answer. Um, but as we go along the way, we will try to answer the questions. So what is discipleship? For the purpose of this training and from... Um, the Great Commission from the way Jesus made disciple, and also from the organic discipleship, the one that we read together, I would define discipleship as this, to help women to know Christ, to grow in their scripture knowledge, to have ongoing character transformation, to become more like Christ, and to live in obedience to Him, to be trained in ministry skill, serve in the body of Christ and in turn help other women do the same which is the multiplication by the way I will give you the slides so don't worry of taking picture taking notes I'll give you the slides through your group leader so your group leader will be dispensing this uh, the slides to you so I just wanted to listen think and enjoy the learning and then later on at the end if you have questions you can ask questions because sometimes for me, it's very difficult to listen to someone and then write, writing down. And then the, the, the lecturer already moved to another uh, topic. So this is the um, definition of discipleship. To help women to know Christ, which is uh, evangelism, right? Go and make disciples of all nations. How can they obey Christ if they don't, they don't know Christ? So first, we need to go and let them know about Christ. To grow in their scripture knowledge, we'll go through this um, as we um, embark on session three and then have ongoing character transformation. It is useless if we just teach the scripture knowledge but the character never change. Because we want the women to grow to become more like Christ. So there are trans element of transformation of character in there. And to live in obedience to him, isn't that? The Great Commission says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And to be trained in ministry skill, to serve in the body of Christ, that we are equipped to do the work of ministry in the body of Christ, at home, at work, wherever we are, we are equipped with skill in the kingdom of God. And in turn, to help other women to do the same. This is the multiplication part. Why? Why should we do discipleship? If I give you a Bible right now, tell me, what, what is God's will for your life? What is God's purpose for you? Here's the Bible. 
Can you open it? Can you pin it? One, two, or three. God's purpose for me. If I give you a Bible, what would you? What will be your answer? You can say that. The great, com- the great, the great, the great commandment, the great commission. Oh, you already know everything. You don't need this this course anymore. <laughs> What is the, the greatest commandment? To love God with all of our hearts, soul, your mind, and action, and to love others sacrificially. Right? This is the this is Jesus saying when the Pharisees asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus gave this answer. Why do you think God wants us to love him. Is this what God's will for you? Do you believe this? This is God's will for you? This is what God wants the purpose of your life to be? Do you believe that? Because our hearts is prone to wonder, right? A human heart is a heart that is prone to wonder from the God that we love. And then John Calvin uh, one time said that um, our hearts, human heart, is the factory of idols. We love other things. In John 21, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Right? And then he asked again, Peter, do you love me more than these? So love, our love for him is very, very important that Jesus would ask Peter three times. What do you think is the this? Peter, do you love me more than this? If Jesus asked Renee, do you love me more than this? What are the this? Any idea? For reference from scripture, Mark chapter 4 talks about the parable of the sower. How many types of soul are there? Four, right? And then the third one is especially interesting. It is the third one, the, the torn, the seeds that fall, fall on the torn. And then it says, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things, choke it and making it unfruitful. So if God asks you today, for example, Johanna, do you love me more than these? What will, what will be your answer? So, the, the will of God, the purpose of, of God is for us is to love Him with all of our hearts, soul, and mind, and not stopping there, to love others sacrificially. Is that it? You already said it before. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. You're a good student. You remember. <laughs> and you can tell us now. The Great Commission, isn't it? Right? And then the sequel is always the greatest commandment first and the Great Commission. The Great Commission said that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. So this is the compass, right? Can, can we make disciples if we don't love God? Remembering the, the definition of the discipleship before, can, is it possible for us to make disciples if we don't first have the love in our hearts? I don't think it's possible because making disciple is really uh, needing the sacrifice from our part and it takes time and really it's it's really the greatest commandment love others sacrificially it is it is um, a sequence the greatest commandment first and then the great commission and do you think this is a do you all agree that this is the command from Jesus when is this great commission is given? When? When? When did Jesus say this? Give this? When he 
was about to ascend to heaven. So it is just like a person who are about to die, right? This is the last word, the last message. And how important that is. Because this is Jesus' last command. This is his last word. Just like when your dad or your mom pass away and, and they gave you the last word, the most important message. Do you think, is it in there, it says that, then Jesus came to them and said that if you want, if you choose to, go and make disciples of all nations. Right? It's, it's, it doesn't have that clause. So, making disciples is a command. It is Jesus' command to all his followers, not only for pastors, for church leaders, for missionaries in your text. I hope you, you will say that for all of us, for all believers in Jesus Christ, not only for church leaders, missionary, not for me, it's for all believers. If we are the followers of Jesus Christ, this is the command. It is not optional. It is not an option. And then for us, for women, uh, there are another comment in scripture that talks about uh, making disciples. But in this context, in the context of older women to younger women. So Titus 2, 3 to 5 says, older, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slander or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their God and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husband that the word of God may not be defiled. So this is what is called the intergenerational women discipleship. It's also in, in, in the questionnaire before. So Paul is asking Titus, who is the pastor in the island of Crete, to urge the older women to disciple the younger women. And the content, it seems like, wow, this is so domestic. Love, husband, children. How about if I'm not married? And today, in our society, it's so different. It's not about home life anymore, right? This is not just it. We work, right? Some, some of us are, are in politics, are in um, theater, in many, many different spheres. We have social circle, we have church friends, we have family, we have um, colleagues at our place. So the context is that we can disciple younger women in wherever we are. At that time, the context in the island of Crete, maybe women just stay home. At that time, during that time, the identity and the life of the woman is just taking care of their husband and children being busy at home. But in today's society, as, as the history progressed, it's not that anymore. Our sphere of influence and our life has been um, expanded so much. Right? So we are going to apply the same principle to different contexts wherever we, we live in. And I want to show you this very interesting, Matthew 28, right? The, uh, the what? The Great Commission. <laughs> Do you see the strategy that God has this strategy already? And Titus 2, 3 to 5. You see that? It's connected, right? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and then in Titus 2, in the inter intergenerational women discipleship, it's connected. It's already given older women, disciple younger women. Okay. As we go on, I will explain what actually the terms of older women, what is uh, younger women, and, and all that. So the, this is a quote from Kay Daigle um, from the book. From ordinary women to spiritual leader. The Great Commission calls each of us into spiritual leadership. What is spiritual leadership? Doesn't mean that you have to be a leader with a title and in, 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 in a, somewhere. Each one of us is a leader because each one of us are influencing the people around us. We are leading whether we want to or not, whether we realize it or not. Right? At home, if you said that, oh, I'm just a mom, I, I read many um, homework, I said, can I just disciple my children at home? Is that count? Okay. In the homework, I'll address that also. 
you are in a spiritual leadership position, right? If you are a company, you're influencing your your employee, your colleagues. If you're a professional, people around you, you are influencing them. Each one of us is given the sphere of influence, whether we realize it or not, whether we want it or not. So it says, you and I are accountable. We are the only Christian who influence specific people. Like for me, my influence will be in this church, the international church. If you put me in the ethnic uh, local church like the Batak church, I'm dead, man. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to communicate. And I don't know how to understand their language. It's like, it's out of place for me to serve there. It is not my sphere of influence, different. But the people that is uh, from the ethnic church, uh, born with that ethnic, ethnic group in that local church, they are the one that would, should carry the Great Commission in that sphere of influence. So each one of us are the ambassador to carry the Great Commission in our own context. We can either ignore our responsibility or we can intentionally turn our influence into spiritual leadership. Every Christ follower is his ambassador to the world and a model and teacher for believers who are younger in faith. I know what's going on in your mind right now. What? Asking me to make disciples? No, I, I cannot. I know. Uh, hold on. And I want to um, read this, 1 Corinthians 1. 26, 29, let me read it, it's from NIV. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So it says that God chose the foolish thing to shame the wise. God chose the weak things to shame the strong. So I, as, as I think about preparing for this training, I, I told God, Lord, you know what? I don't have what it takes to do this, but you call me. I am not smart. I am so average. I am not gifted at all. I am not talented at all. There's nothing so there's nothing special even a bit about me. What I have is just I'm willing. If you want to use me, here I am, but I don't have this, I don't have this, I have this limitation, this, but I am willing. So in my prayer for the last week is that I said, Lord, this is my five loaves and two fish, right? Not, not five fish and two loaves, right? Mm -hmm. Five loaves and two fish. Just like the boy, that's all he, he has and he give it all and then God take it and multiply it. The same thing with me. That's all I have, not much. But if you want to use me, take it and multiply it. So that is, I think, that's who we are. When God calls us, we're nobody. We're weak, we're foolish, but God chose us to manifest His glory, His, His grace, His power in us. So don't feel that because I am weak, I am this, this, God cannot use me. It's the other way around. Because you're weak, because we're foolish, that, that is why that God chose us. Another quote from Walter Henrichen uh, from Disciples Are Made Not Born. It says, many are afraid to become involved in the task of follow-up because they feel inadequate. Aren't we all feeling that? This book is written in the, in the uh, North America. And I've seen it happening also in Asia, in Jakarta, in this church. I've been talking to many women. This is what... They, they, they told me, and I feel the same thing also. They don't think they know enough about the Christian life to assume the responsibility of becoming a spiritual parent. Or they feel that they have so far to go in the Christian life 
themselves that someone should be teaching them rather than they teaching someone else. All these feelings of inadequacy are quite normal and probably will never leave. I have never met parents who, while raising their children, felt that they had all the answers. We all feel inadequate, then it's okay. It's okay. If we don't feel inadequate, I think there is something, maybe we are too pride, where we are, too, we are conceited, we, we are too prideful. It is, we are inadequate, but it is because of that that God can use us, and we cannot boast because we have nothing. We're just an instrument. We're just a tool in God's hand. So this is, um, yeah, it's, it's quite normal. When I talk to women, and then also in your homework, right? In your homework, uh, many uh, of you said that, I, when the, answering the question, what is your fear? And you said that, I fear that I don't know enough of the Bible. And then what is the solution? The solution is you write, I will study more of the Bible. That's good, study more of the Bible. But what is lacking? What is lacking? The motto of Nike, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Just make the first step of faith and just do it. Disciple the younger women who need you, around you. Just do it. And you don't need to be a, a theologian before you begin. When I begin, later on, Nadia will give her testimony. I'll give, she will give from her side. I will give from my side. I don't know anything when she asks me. I don't know anything. But I'm just a willing body. And then at a time, I said, Lord, what do I do with this woman? What should I do? And I am not a theologian. But I learn along the way. You don't need to wait until you are perfect, you're good enough, this, this, this. You never be. You learn as you go. And to answer the question, is my children at home? So let me go back to here. If I just have my children at home, is it already considered discipleship? Yes. Your children is your primary disciple at home. Okay. But it doesn't mean that you don't need to do the Great Commission. Yes, you need to disciple your children. But you also need to fulfill the Great Commission because we are all followers of Jesus Christ. Right? Now, the question is that how much, right? Each person capacity is, is, is different. For me, because I am an, my, my daughter is already an adult, I don't have a young kid at home, so I'm pretty free. So I can disciple more, I can spend time with ladies more. But if you're a mom with young children, that your children need you at home, Maybe your capacity right now, maybe zero. It's okay. You can you can wait. But if you have free time, for example, if your children go to school, if you're homeschooled, it's a different case. And then if your husband is not supportive, yeah, probably that's not the season right now. But if your children go to school, and then what do you do? Well, your children go to school. You can start discipling, meeting with younger women. You can see around, oh, these parents, younger than me, she's traveling. Maybe I can reach out. Maybe I can have lunch, cup of tea, getting to know this, this lady. You can, actually. But you need to be intentional. Don't wait until they come to you. You can reach out. Later, we'll talk about it is whose responsibility is this to approach. So, the truth to remember is, if you forget anything else today, this is the two that I want you to remember, okay? Number one is, making disciple is Christ's command. It is not optional. Who disagree? It's not me, it's not my idea, it's, it's, it's Jesus' idea, it's the scripture. It is called the biblical imperative of disciple making. Imperative means command. Right? Biblical imperative of disciple making. And number two, God uses ordinary women who are willing to obey. We don't have to have it all. We don't have, need to be perfect. We are because God uses ordinary women who are willing to obey. Can we read it together? Number one, 
A disciple is Christ's command. It is not optional. Number two, God uses ordinary women women who are willing to obey Him. So this is it. If you're willing to obey, just do it. And that, this is the book by Bill Hall. Um, it's called Conversion and Discipleship. Let me read it from page 47. In recent years, Christians have been divided into two categories. At the core of this division is the idea that salvation has two parts. First, a person receives Christ as a Savior. Sometime later, they submit to Him as Lord. This understanding has led to the existence of two-tiered Christian population. Those who are saved and just waiting for heaven, and those who are serious about their faith. Isn't that we see it in every church? There are people who just come and then uh, just sit down and then go home and never do anything and never grow. After many years going to church, maybe 20 years, going to church but never grow and never bear fruits for the kingdom of God and there are those the second category who are working who are serving who are active who are serious about their faith who are making disciples and we all see that in every church whether in North America or here in Indonesia everywhere in the world there's this two tier two class of Christian isn't that so sad Still, continuation, we call our church member Christian, but refrain from calling them disciples because the term refers to a deeper level of commitment, right? Do you call yourself disciple? Disciple Elfira, right? We, we call Christian. And then when, when, when someone can say disciples, like this, the term is, is kind of like, make you feel uncomfortable because you are put it into it, elevated higher than everybody else. That is wrong. Why that's wrong? Because disciples were called Christian. Christians are disciples. Disciples are Christian. It says in the book of Acts, Acts 11, it should be the same. But why it is not the fault of the congregation if this concept of biblical imperative of making disciples is never gone. And that's why I'm so burdened that I cannot put it down unless I do something about it. This is God's command. And no, not many Christians know about this. And, they, and we just go on live an oblivion like as if it's nothing happened. I know it. If I don't tell anyone, I think I'm guilty before the Lord. How? So we talk about the what, right? We talk about the why. The why? What is the why? Can somebody review? What? Why? Yes, obedience to Christ. It is the command, right? It is not an optional. It is not human idea. It's his idea. It's his command. How? Is I would like to learn from Jesus and from the book, also from organic discipleship, from the Great Commission itself, from that definition of discipleship, I'm going to go through the how. Actually, that definition of discipleship is the how and the target and the goal. Each sentence is the goal. And then we will see the life of Jesus and how he made uh, the disciple, how he discipled the twelve, actually. And in that, so I uh, kind of like summarized into six steps of disciple making process. And each week we are going through this step. So today is the introduction. I would like today to build the foundation of biblical foundation that um, Great Commission, Greatest Commandment, Titus 2 are the three fundamental foundation of disciple making. That's today. Next week we are going to talk of evangelism go and make disciples sometimes we can have a disciples or younger women that we're helping already christian but sometimes they're not believers yet but god brought them to our our, our sphere she's willing she's seeking she's struggling but she doesn't know the lord yet what do we do share the gospel we build friendship 
we we evangel evangelize to them. That's the first step. Evangelism will be next week. And then after they become believers, after they cross the line from death to life, what do we do? We teach them. Remember the definition is to for them to grow in their scripture knowledge. Right? It is very important for a person to know the Bible. How can they obey? Right? If they don't know, how can they obey? How couldn't they know if you don't teach? But again, you don't need to be a theologian to be able to teach. You can learn together. You can learn along the way. And, and then fellowship. Remember Jesus uh, spent 24-7 with his 12, the 12 disciples. Eat together, walk together, uh, serve together. So this fellowship outside of that Bible study, then do life together is very important. We're going to talk about that in the following week. And then ministry, that in Jesus' way of discipling is he built the ministry skills. He equipped the 12 and he sent them for ministry, doing ministry together. Because we are called to build, to equip workers, right? In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. We are called to equip the body of Christ so that every believer is equipped to do the works. And then multiplication. Okay? Help after a, a, a young woman is already being discipled. Um, the time is relative. Um, if you read later in Organic Discipleship, he, uh, Dennis McCollum um, discipled a young man, an ex-con, uh, ex-prisoner uh, who was drug addict, and then he discipled him, and until one day, this guy, I think the name is Horatio, become an elder in his church. It takes seven years, but that is the extreme case, right? Um, each person is different, Depends. If you start from evangelism, probably takes longer time. But if that woman is so uh, ready and is already a believer, already have some foundation, in three, four years, I have a discussion with, with my husband, Andra. He said that, Han, he said, he complained to me, when you disciple someone, it takes too long for you to, before you send them out and make disciple again. Yeah, but they're not ready. I said, and he said, you get them ready when on a job. They will never get ready. Once they are becoming a disciple, an older woman to the younger woman, spiritual parent, they grow. Look at us. We grow because of that. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, 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 I'll try it. And I talked to the ladies. She went, no, 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 no. No, we're not ready. It, it's, again, it's uh, the timing. Each person is different, but not too long. Not too long. And then the last part is worship. Worship is not just singing. Worship is the greatest commandment to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and action, and love others sacrificially, and to obey Him. Right? Live in obedience to Him. That's worship. All that that we do is worship. And I would like to invite Nadia to come, to come up here and give your testimony Good morning, ladies. My name is Nadia. Um, I accepted Christ as my personal Savior and Lord on November 4, 2002. I remember the date so clearly because that day was so special to me, and I still remember how joyful and excited I was to hear the gospel for the first time and to receive the free gift of salvation that was offered by God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But what happened with my life after that? Um, I learned more about basic Christian faith, basic doctrines of salvation, baptism, etc. Yes, life was different for me, but I have to be honest, I was very lukewarm in my faith. I have this thinking that my salvation is now guaranteed, no more worries about that. I met one of the elders' wife every six weeks or so. We chatted about life, my struggle, she prayed for me, gave me suggestions, and I already considered her as my mentor. 
two years into our marriage, my husband drew himself away from the Lord, and I guess that's where I felt left alone in my faith journey, not knowing where to go and what to do. For the first time in my life, in so much pain, I really sought God. There was this lady who was my pre-marital counselor, uh, also the former JICF elder's wife. She had moved back to Singapore at that time, who kept on telling me, Mimi will be a good mentor for you. So if, you are, if you've been at JICF for quite a long time, maybe you could guess who is the elder's wife who's already gone back to Singapore, you know? So I asked, so I came to Mimi uh, and asked her if she would be willing to become my mentor. That was in 2008. I didn't know what I was asking for. I was thinking this would be just like the previous mentorship relationship that I had with the elder's wife. We started to meet weekly. In the beginning, it was just the two of us studying the Bible. And not long after that, the two more ladies joined us, and since then, my Saturday mornings have been blocked for our weekly meetings from 9 a.m. until noon. And we also serve together in The Rock. I would say discipleship relationship attributes the most to my accelerated growth in Christ. There are three areas of growth that I would like to highlight. Scripture knowledge, character transformation, and ministry skill. My scripture knowledge grew as a result of my understanding of the importance of daily devotion and from our weekly Bible study. Character transformation is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit with the help of my discipleship group who challenged me to put into practice the biblical principle that we learn from the Bible study. Every time I share with them my struggles in marriage, family relationship, or at work. Character transformation also happens as we grow in our friendship. We don't just meet during our weekly Bible studies. We go out to lunches, dinners, celebrating each other's birthdays, baby showers, bridal showers. We also mourn from for once multiple miscarriages and the death of loved ones. Basically, we do life together. These ladies in my discipleship group are my best friends. This relationship shapes my new understanding about relationship, marriage, work, ministry, and everything else in life. This is what I learned, what it truly meant to become the follower of Jesus. Serving together with Mimi at The Rock is a huge advantage in my ministry skill growth. I started out as a preschool teacher with zero knowledge about teaching children. A few years later, Mimi asked me to lead the preschool department overlooking three classes. Years later again, she asked me to lead the elementary department overlooking six classes. In each stage of my ministry role, Mimi coached me to become a leader. I follow her example in leading the rock. Coordinators meet monthly, and we also learn about new skills each year, um, public teaching, evangelizing, shepherding, biblical counseling, and how to equip the teachers. As the result of our public speaking training, um, coordinators, including myself, became co-speakers with Mimi during monthly women seminars. Throughout our early discipleship years, Mimi kept telling me that one day I had to multiply and invest my life in others. But unless she kicked my butt, I would pretend I didn't hear it. <laughs> I wouldn't have the courage to start. I just kept quiet, hoping that she might forget about it. I was not ready. And I think my feeling at this time, at that time, represents most of us. Am I good enough to mentor another person? How about the bad habits that I still have? How about the time commitment? But after five years of being discipled, Mimi said to me, it's time for you to disciple others. With my position as a coordinator at The Rock, there were several ladies that are available to be discipled. So in 2013, I just started, not really sure what I was doing. I have to say that I learned even more as I mentor others. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I experienced the joy of someone's baptism and spiritual growth but also tears and pain from that same person who deliberately chose to disobey God. And I eventually I had to end the discipleship relationship. And then I started a new group, and again I experienced the joy of seeing someone's growth, but also tears and pain from the other's ongoing disobedience. I still learn up, up until now. Joining last year's disciple-making training pilot class opened my eyes a lot about my mistakes in disciple-making, and it 
equipped me bet to do better in the future. After the training, I'm even more convinced that I would disciple others as long as I can. Yes, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever experienced in my life, but also the most rewarding ones. For all of you who are here today, I hope after this training you will be as convinced as me. No one will think that they are ready. Just start with one lady. Spend time with her, become her friend, study the word together, and love her. God is not looking for a perfect person who is ready. God is looking for someone who is willing, and he will equip you. Thank you. So when Nadia came to me, 208, so I said, I said yes to her, but in my heart, what do I do with her? Lord, what do I do with her? So she asked me May, I think we started the Bible study in July in 2008. So those months, I uh, read so many books about discipleship. I want to learn, I want to prepare myself because I don't know how to. As I started to read whatever material that are available about discipleship. And I learned so much along the way. So Nadia is my guinea pig. <laughs> so I think I owe it to Nadia for my blessed life today. If it is not because of her, I will not understand the biblical imperative of the Great Commission. I wouldn't understand it because I wouldn't read the material or read and then learn to search for how to disciple a woman. I will not. But because of that, that is Nadia is used by God to begin and after that I disciple many other ladies. And in this case it's Nadia's uh, initiative to ask me. Okay, so but according to Titus 2, 3 to 5, it says that older women teach the younger women. So the command is given to the older women. But this older woman never understand that until the younger woman come and asks. So I guess who, who asks is not really important. Uh, the younger woman can ask, the older woman can also uh, initiate, it doesn't matter. As long as the uh, relationship is, is building. And who is the older woman? Who is the younger woman? We'll talk about that. As I sit at the back, my husband uh, pointed out to me when I talk about Titus 2, 3 to 5, I talk about that's the context in, in the island of uh, Crete long time ago. Today we have other sphere of influence. But it doesn't mean that loving our husbands, submitting to them, being busy at home, being kind, being pure is not important. Right? It's not that it's not relevant anymore. We still need to love our husband. <laughs> the wife knows that. We're still applicable until today. And submit to the husband. Um, I want to talk about personality. Um, if you already take Myers Briggs, this is Myers Myers Briggs. If you don't know what is your Myers Briggs, you can take go to www.16personalities.com. So. Is these are the 16 personalities. I am an introvert. Okay? For people who are extrovert, to meet with people, to meet with uh, new people, to be with people, is very easy. But for introvert, people sometimes are draining us. Okay? When I, I remember when I was young, I was so shy, I'm so introvert that during the recess when children are playing, I hide behind my teacher's skirt. I follow her because I, I so feel insecure. And then during the high school, I still remember, I never want to hang out longer. The bell rang, boom, go. <laughs> and then if there's any gathering, I don't want to go because I am that introvert. But over the years, that uh, changed me. I'm still introvert today. I still gain energy when I'm alone, but I am comfortable with people. I love people. I love spending time with people. Do you know what is the cure for my depression right now? If I get depressed, the cure is to meet people. <laughs> if I stay home alone, the depression will go even deeper. I go out and meet the people. You have to choose the people, not the one that train you. <laughs> you have to be wise. You want to be encouraged, not to be sucked out, sucked dry. 
So, personality, it's not an excuse. God give us our personality. God make us to become introvert, extrovert, right? And then the command to make disciples is for all believers, extrovert or introvert, whatever we are. We can. God uses ordinary women who are willing to obey. Definition of older women. So women, but this is the definition of older women. Women who are more mature in their faith journey and life experiences, no matter their age. Their accumulated life experiences should be filtered through faithfulness to Christ. The older women exhibit a consistent walk with God. And their lives are marked by faithful obedience to Christ as they persevere victoriously through trials and failures. So can you disciple someone who is older than you in age? Yes. Yes. I remember 10 years ago when I was 39, I discipled someone who is 12 years older than me. This is a Canadian, different culture. It's possible. And ever since then, yeah, I have discipled ladies that are older than me in age, but probably in, in terms of my life stage, I'm ahead. Like, for example, I, my daughter are older, so I've gone through the stage where uh, how to handle teenage rebellion and all that. But the ladies are older in age than me. It's okay. It, it can happen. And so no excuse. Oh, this is probably older than me. I cannot. No excuse, it can happen. And then, also there's a myth that, yeah, yeah, I want to disciple women, but I need to disciple first before I can disciple. That's also a myth. I have never been discipled. I've never been discipled. So when I ask me, oh, what is mentoring me? I don't know what this discipleship is all about. I learned it myself. But I grow and I, I know more as I go along. So you don't need to be disciple first before you can disciple others. This training is what it's all about. So just do it. What is the definition of mature women? Older doesn't mean mature, correct? Older doesn't mean mature. It has to be mature. The key is mature women. What is mature woman? It is the constant ability to apply God's word and biblical principle into her choices and action. In other words, to live in obedience to Christ. As Hebrew 5.14 says, he is able to distinguish good from evil. And this is the quote again from Nancy DeMoss. I guess all of you know Nancy DeMoss. Um, she says, this is the encouragement for older women. For, all, for the older women, what does it mean for you to go against the flow? It means choosing not to spiritually retire. It means not settling for a life consumed by golf, bridge, meaningless activity. I don't know here, but golf, bridge, maybe not bridge. I don't, I don't think this, in this culture in Jakarta, but <laughs> Arisan. Ah, Arisan, Arisan, what is Arisan in English? <laughs> or go to salon, go to massage, go to you know social club, I don't know, whatever the activity is, the one that doesn't have the eternal value. Or preoccupation with self. I guess salon and all that is preoccupation with self, right? There are too many younger women who need your counsel and encouragement. Too many struggling sisters who could be uplifted by your love and prayers. Take one or two of them under your wing. Help them learn how to live in such a way that pleases God. This does not require that you know everything or that you have the right. It merely requires your willingness to find and receive your place in God's kingdom. Would you take one or two under your wing? They need you. They need um, your wisdom, your encouragement. They need your love and care. So 
what is the role of older women? So this this four is from uh, another is from an author, uh, mother figure. Yeah, I think in a way, uh, I I would say yes, I agree that as you take on the ladies under you, you kind of like the spiritual mother when they're in, in trouble, they call you, they cry, and you have to comfort them, give them encouragement, or even if they call at twelve, you have to go find her and encourage her if, you can, if you're in trouble sort of like parenting spiritual parenting that you took the position of a mother for nurturing them residence theologian uh, I, I disagree because this is a quote I cannot change it but I disagree you don't have to be a theologian remember you don't need to you just learn along the way if you love scripture if you love the word of God you will be okay a counselor, yeah. Biblical counseling, it sometimes is needed. So as, as we grow, as we disciple many ladies, each lady has a different issue. Right? As a discipler, you learn so many things as you help them grow, as you help them deal with issues. It could be same sex attraction, it could be eating disorder, it could be pornography, it could be premarital sex, it could be um, affair with a married man, so many things that you learn along the way. And don't don't think that I know all that. I don't know. As they come, oh no, Lord, what do I do? And God always help. God always provide. And because of that, I learn a lot. How do I know? How to handle same-sex attraction? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I learn along the way. And by the way, um, in the context of discipleship, whenever the context that this is my experience um, doesn't mean it's the best, we always disciple in a group. That I find it it's not conducive. It is just one on one. It's just her and me, tak 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 like this. But if there are other people, other ladies, like for example three or four in a group, the dynamic is very good. And when this shared struggle. I don't know the answer, but this lady know the answer. Oh, then she can give her perspective. When, and then when, when someone is in need, like in midnight, I'm already sleeping, right? But the other lady is still awake. And then in the WhatsApp group, man, day, I need help, I need prayer, I need this. And the other ladies can come down, but I'm not available. So discipleship in group has many potential, and has many benefits compared to just one-on-one. -on -one. But it has to be a close group. Okay. Once you start, for example, with, with three or with four, that's it. Goes for some time, two years, three years, you don't take in new lady in the middle because trust has been built, transparency is required. When you bring new people, then the person, the lady, like, oh no, new people, I don't want to share my story, I don't want to share my struggle. How about if she gossip around? How, how about if she tell other people I'm doomed? Okay. So, uh, it has to be a closed group situation. A girlfriend to hang out with. Shopping, watch movies, eating, go to restaurants, trying food. Rewards for the, rewards for the older women. This is from Dr. Hund uh, Howard Hendricks. Um, close relationship with another person. It's a very close relationship. It's life on life together together. Personal renewal. Um, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You might think that, oh, sacrificing for others. You must be tired. Poor you. No way. You're blessed. You're joyful. You're energized. It's like a purpose. Satisfaction. Joy. Especially when you see the lady that you're helping growing. It gives you like, energize you. So people energize you. Introvert can say that. It can happen for introvert. Right? There's a joy, sense of self-fulfillment. Of course, you are doing something meaningful in the life of other people. Impact through the younger woman's life. When you are helping someone grow, do you think just her, the one that grow? Do you think just her, the one that impacted? No, right? Her husband, her children, her sister, her co-worker. People around her also is being impacted by that one life. 
the, the last two is my edition. This is the last two is my edition, not Dr. Howard Hendricks. Accelerated spiritual growth. So, like Henry and I agree that we grow since we take up people under us. Like, man, we need to shape up. They are looking at us. We cannot just mess up. We cannot just do anything that we like. Before I do something else, I better think 100 times because I am a role model for someone else. And because of that, we grow so fast spiritually. Like never before. Never in my life that I grow so much before Nadia asked me to disciple her. Never. That's why I, I said I owe it to, to her because I live a blessed life after that. Eternal rewards. This is not just for here. This is for eternal. This is not investment just on this earth. This is for later. Thousands of years. Thousands of years. And I am so looking forward to when I see my Lord. And then when I see all of you. When I see the ladies. And the ripple effect of what we do. Simple thing. The five loaves and the two fish That God take and multiply it. Any kind of like domino effect. You never know. That one life that you influence, influence others, influence others, the domino effect continue on. And you'll find out about that in heaven one day. Now I would like to address the singer. The Titus concept does not just apply to married women. Right? Although it says love your husband, da 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 da, da it's not applied only to married women. All women are called to encourage and equip other women to glorify God. A woman doesn't have to be married and have children to know God's principle for womanhood and to help other women obey this principle. The leaders of a woman's ministry must be unyielding in their commitment to the principle of discipleship presented in Titus 2. I love single women. Why? Because they are so available. When I call them, they are always available. It's different, right? From married women. Oh, my kids, and they, oh, my husband, and they, see the woman? Yes, 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 yes. Always available. Right? And although you're, you're single, you're called to make disciples. Can single women disciple married women? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But maybe in the area of parenting, you need help. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that lady can learn from someone else in the area of parenting. Yeah. But yes, you can. Doesn't mean that you're single, you cannot. Yes, you can. So I would like to close with this reminder again that the greatest com commandment to love God and to love others is the foremost command. Right? This is, it is the purpose of our life, the will of God. To make disciples of all nation, teaching them to obey. Then, through to remember, let's read it one more time. You can forget everything else, but remember this too. Making disciples is Christ's command. It is not optional. God uses ordinary women who are willing to obey. Okay, before we uh, close, so many people ask me, why only seven chapters that we read this? Uh, the answer is, the seven chapters is the fundamental on how you choose a disciple, you begin the relationship. It is what you need, especially if you are uh, beginning wanting to disciple others. This seven is, is should be sufficient. And only we're meeting only for seven weeks. So do you want to read two chapters a week? No, right? We don't want <laughs> That's why I didn't assign it. Uh, that's why it's... Chapter 8 and onwards, it is for those who are already discipling and having difficulty. For example, the disciple doesn't grow, uh, what about uh, stagnation, what do you do? So the chapter 8 onwards is for those who are already in disciple making. Uh, you, I would encourage you to finish the book, uh, although we only read until 7 in this course, but read on, finish uh, reading the book. In the pilot class, we read two books because when I invite them, I already told them there are two books, one chapter a week. Um, this is the 
accompaniment, the master plan of evangelism. Chapter one, organic discipleship mentioned this book by Robert Coleman. This is a very, very good book. It's considered classic. If you want, if you if you are an avid learner, an avid reader, you want to add more, <coughs> uh, we have the stock. You can get it from uh, Mona later. But you don't need to report, you don't need to do any homework. Just read it for your own uh, 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 supplement if you want to. Okay, we have four minutes. Any question related to today? Related to today's teaching? Lecture. Any question? Yes, Should we disciple say another church, but they don't go to the same church? Is it possible? Yes, yes, yes. You can indeed. The question is, uh, can we disciple someone who goes to another church? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. You can disciple just anyone. But in terms of effectiveness, probably not as effective as you are in the same ministry together because the model that we will see is the model of Jesus where they stay together, do ministry together, do life together. But it's possible, yeah, still. You can disciple anyone. Any other question? Are you still digesting? <laughs> okay, if, if there is no um, other question, um, please continue to do your homework and as much as possible, please come every uh, Saturday, not missing uh, any of the session um, so that it's building uh, upon each, each other. Um, after the closing prayer, we go, are going to have a toilet break for 10 minutes. And at 11.20, we're going to come back and then do our discussion group according to uh, is your group already divided. it. Mariana's group will be on the library. And then the rest of the four groups we're going to meet here. We're just going to do uh, here. Two here and, and two here, four groups. After toilet break, eleven twenty, we'll, we'll come back. Let's let's do closing prayer. Thank you, Father, for um, session one, Father. Um, I pray that uh, what has been planted, what has been said, Lord, we use it um, to work in each of our hearts, Father. And your Holy Spirit continue to nudge us, continue to give us understanding, conviction, and uh, change our beliefs, Father, according to what. Uh, you want us to do and what you want us to understand. Thank you, Father. We just want to also surrender the discussion time, Lord, into your hand. Christ, and we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies.